Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Steve Boylan from the Department of Command Leadership and want to welcome you to the Profession of Arms and Mission Command panel. As a reminder, please ensure your cell phones are either off or on silent. For today, the opening remarks by each member of the panel will be for attribution. Once we go to your questions, your questions and the responses from the panel will not be recorded or for attribution, especially for anyone considering the use of social media. Today we have with us four distinguished individuals, both representing our military and academic pursuits. As I'm sure you've all read their bios, I'll only highlight a few things. First, Major General John Koloszewski, Commanding General, 1st ID, just down the road at Fort Riley. Prior to his arrival at Fort Riley, he serves as the Deputy Chief of Staff G357 for U.S. Forces Command. Commissioned as an armor officer, he holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Management from Bucknell University, a Master's degree in Engineering Management and Interactive Simulations Training and Systems Design from University of Central Florida, and Strategic Studies from the United States Army War College. As you can imagine, leadership positions from platoon leader to deputy CG, now commanding general. In addition, he was a senior Army fellow with the Council on Foreign Relations with duty in New York City. Next, Dr. Martin Cook, who retired from the U.S. Naval War College in 2017 as the Admiral Stockdale Professor of, military, of Professional Military Ethics. He now holds that title as Emeritus Professor. Dr. Cook was previously professor and deputy department head at the Philosophy Department of the Air Force Academy and the Elihu Root Professor of Military Studies and Professor of Ethics at the U.S. Army War College. Dr. Cook received his Ph.D. and Master's from the University of Chicago and his B.A. from University of Illinois, recently stepping down from serving for seven years as the co-editor of the Journal of Military Ethics. Next, we have Major General James Mingus, Commanding General 18, uh, sorry, 82nd Airborne Division, Fort Bragg. He began his career enlisted in the Iowa National Guard and later commissioned in field artillery, graduating from Winona State University and later branched infantry after he entered active duty in 1987. During his career, General Mingus has commanded every echelon from company to brigade in addition to working in key staff positions in the Army Special Operations Forces and joint units. General Mingus has served in both Iraq and Afghanistan as well as here at Fort Leavenworth as Deputy I'm sorry, uh, Director of Mission Command Center of Excellence. Welcome back to Fort Leavenworth, sir. Our last member of the panel is Dr. Don Snyder, commissioned in West Point, 1962, has served in the nation for over five decades as both a soldier and scholar. As an infantry officer, he served three combat tours in Vietnam, commanding a battalion in the 7th Infantry Div and the 7th Infantry Division. Later, Dr. Snyder, while still on active duty, was a federal executive fellow at the Brookings Institute. He's been a member of the National Security Council and the White House as Director of Defense Policy in both the Reagan and Bush administrations. After retiring from active duty, he served for many years as a faculty at West Point, led the Academy's effort, and more recently those of other services to renew the study of military professions, their ethics, and their civil military relations. Dr. Snyder departed the Academy in 2008 as Professor Emeritus and the second civilian in the Academy's history to be so honored. He has subsequently joined the Army War College as professor of the Army profession and the Center for the Army Profession Ethic as a senior fellow. In these positions, he helped lead a two-year effort to produce a first-ever doctor on the U.S. Army as a military profession, ADRP-1, which I'm sure all of you have read. Before I go to the students for their questions, I would like to ask each of the panelists for uh, their take on this question. Based on your experiences over the length of your career, how has the profession of arms changed and what has been your most significant challenges? Doc, uh, General Koloszewski, would you please start? Very hot, sir. Very hot. Very hot. Okay, super. Hey, uh, first, uh, for General Lundy and, and General Moraney, and thanks for allowing me to participate in the, in the panel. Uh, it, it's very, very apparent that I am the one that's dragging down the IQ uh, for the uh, collective panel itself. Uh, but, but seriously, I mean, this is, is a, a, a very important topic uh, for all of us uh, in attendance today, uh, and it's something that we have to uh, revisit uh, periodically. And for you, I mean, this is a great opportunity to ask questions and also learn from us, learn from each other. Um, in terms of the question itself, uh, in terms of how has the, arm, the, the uh, uh, profession changed, profession of arms changed, I, I would suggest that I think that the Army profession is based on five fundamental characteristics. 
uh, trust, honorable service, military experience, stewardship, and esprit de corps. Uh, and I think that those have remained consistent over time during my career. I've been in just over 30 years, joined uh, Cold War, still going on, uh, is an all voluntary force, uh, all volunteer force. And I think that, you know, what I have seen change, though, is the operating environment that we have found ourselves and the demands that we have put on our soldiers, in particular our leaders. Again, when I joined, uh, it was the Cold War. Uh, we were uh, facing off against, then at that time, the Soviet Union. Uh, peer on peer, uh, peer near peer, uh, large scale ground combat operations. And then shortly thereafter, uh, we had 2001 and 9 11 take place, and we found ourselves operating and fighting in a counterinsurgency. And now we've kind of come back full circle to where we once again are pre uh, preparing for large scale ground combat operations. And so those kind of tug at what leaders and soldiers uh, are, are responsible for and how they approach that. Uh, technology within that operational environment is one that does present challenges, presents great opportunities, but it does uh, present great challenges. Uh, then the second thing I would say is time. Uh, you never get enough time to prepare yourself or your organizations uh, for mission, uh, be it a rotational mission to Europe, Korea, the central uh, 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 AOR, CENTCOM's AOR, uh, or for, for combat. And so trying to optimize the time that you have available uh, and not waste soldiers' times or yourself uh, is, is can and is a bit challenging. So in terms of consistency, I've seen consistency in the profession of arms. I've seen leaders that will hold themselves and others accountable when we miss the mark. Uh, but the operating environment is one that is, uh, I've seen the greatest change, and it does present some, some demands on, on leaders and soldiers. Thank you, sir. Um, forgive me, I wrote out my remarks just so I could be as concise as possible. Although I'm an Air Force brat, uh, my dad flew B-47s in the Cold War. The first half of my career was spent in civilian academia, most of it at Santa Clara University in California. When I accepted the ethics position at the Army War College in 1998, my learning curve for all things Army was quite steep. Soon after I started, Don Snyder, who is batting cleanup for us today, began a research program at West Point on the importance of seeing Army service as professional activity in a robust sociological sense, as opposed to the ordinary sense in which we describe as professional anything people do for money. Uh, a concern I have, to be honest with you, is that wonderful work that culminated in a volume called The Future of the Army Profession uh, remain in the collective consciousness of the Army because it's a very important piece of work and one that I hope that people are still reading in your generation of officers. Um, eventually, I had the honor of writing a chapter for that project, which culminated in that collection that I just mentioned. That was 20 years ago now. Um, so I, again, want to insist that uh, I encourage you to give it a good look. If you don't want to do that, if you go to YouTube and put, quote, Naval War College, close quote, and Snyder, in quotes, you'll get four or five talk, excellent talks by Don covering that material uh, that you can watch easily on YouTube. After I left Carlisle, I went on to teach and work at the Air Force Academy and the Naval War College. So I managed to work for each of the services at various points. I quickly discovered that the Army's great work on the profession put it far ahead of the other services. To some degree, the, um, that is still true. But when David Petraeus was forced to resign from the CIA, then Secretary of Defense Hagel created a position um, of a kind of DOD czar for ethics and appointed Admiral Reg Peg Klein to the position. This demonstrated his strongly and deeply, uh, strongly held belief um, that all the services needed to be thinking more deeply and working better to ensure a focus on ethics. Each service eventually created some kind of center to be the service's focal point for these questions. She became the rallying point for inter-service conversation and sharing of best practices throughout the inter-service conferences and monthly VTCs among the services. As the Stockdale Ethics Chair at the Naval War College, I sat down on those because the president of the Naval War College was designated as the Navy's point of contact for this effort. As Dr. Snyder will discuss in his remarks in a few minutes, uh, we all came to see that focusing on the idea that military service is a professional activity 
be became a common non-sectarian way of articulating the moral basis of military service. And I certainly adopted that language and framework thoroughly in my work with the Air Force and with the Navy, constantly using it as a touchstone for articulating professional military ethics. As Admiral, as Admiral, Admiral Kelly once said, you've been thoroughly Snyderized, and I think that's true. Um, a couple of points I want to stress about the nature of professions. If I go see a doctor and she tells me that she hasn't read a thing or attended a conference uh, since medical school, I'll be seeking another doctor. Um, this is because it is part of the professional ethic that she be obligated to be as current as possible in advances in, medic in medical research, pharmacology, and surgical procedures. In other words, ethics for a professional is not merely about being a good and honest person. Merely good and honest but intellectually lazy is professionally unethical. Since the job of the professional is to serve the client as well as possible, the professional has an obligation to be anticipating changes in the environment and foreseeing and preparing continually to meet those new challenges. I would suggest that this aspect of the professional ethic is highly relevant to you in this room. The Army and all the other services are clearly in major reset points. Important questions of training and equipping will need to be answered and made, and those will require trying to see as hard as well as possible to make sure we're correctly configuring uh, the services for future challenges. As former Secretary Rumsfeld famously put it, you go to a war with the Army you have, not with the Army you might want or wish to have at some other time. So what is the army you're going to have when you need to go? Will it be the right army? This has several implications. Nobody's crystal ball is perfect, so it's unlikely that the services will anticipate exactly what they will need. But it's a professional ethical obligation to not simply follow bureaucratic inertia in thinking about acquisition and training. For example, many in the army think that it needs to be reconfigured and equipped for major combat operations against peer or near peer competitors. But I would point it to a new book uh, published by Sean McFade at the National Defense University called The New Rules of War, in which he argues that although that course may lie closer to the Army's comfort zone, um, it's more likely that we'll be facing uses of force quite different to that which would ideally optimize for, the, for that kind of Army. I don't bring it up to endorse McFade's view necessarily, but I would suggest that it's part of our challenge to read it and think about it. Um, so in answer to the initial question posed for the panel, I would point you to the framework of the Army <coughs> profession to help frame your responsibility to think this through as clearly and honestly as you can. Oh, you don't have the little green light. How's everybody doing? Well, I, like my colleagues, I am very, very excited to be here. I think I didn't get to talk to all of you, but uh, when we were out here a couple months ago, um, we got to talk to many of you, and, and I am humbled and honored to, to be here once again, and also humbled and honored to, to sit with the folks that are kind of sitting to my, my left and right. We're also all very, very cognizant of uh, the fact that you just ate. I just ate, so if I fall asleep during my, my remarks, I would ask Dr. Snyder to please uh, kick me under the table. Um, but it was kind of alluded to, I, I'm almost on my 38th uh, year anniversary. I joined on 28 December 1981, and I'll kind of start there based on the question that was posed. I was 17 years old, it was Alpha Battery, first of the 194 field artillery in the little town called uh, Spencer, Iowa. And um, the Army was a different arm. My dad was in that unit, my brother was in that same unit a couple years later, and so my dad's friends were the non-commissioned officers that uh, were in that unit. And I thought pretty highly of that group of individuals. But I'd been in the unit about two months. We went to the field for the first time. We had a little local train area that we went to uh, fairly routinely, and we packed up all our stuff. We rolled out to the field. We did a couple of dry fire missions. It was about noon, and the coolers came out, the beers came out, and that was kind of the end of, of training. Um, we hung around because it was a little cold when, when you're in Iowa in, in February, March time frame. It was still a little chilly out, so we didn't stay that long. Uh, but we came back, recovered our stuff. The coolers continued to stay out, and we just, the party continued into uh, to the night. And if you're wondering, hey, he was only 17 years old back then, the drinking age was 18. And so if you even remotely look like you shaved, um, 
it, it was probably okay and you weren't having a hard time uh, getting a beer. Now, this is the attribution part, but I think I'm past the <laughs> statute of limitations of, of underage drinking. Well, we hope it works for yeah. us, sir. I think for drinking underage, that's like a five-year limit. Well, a couple years later, I'm a lieutenant in, in Europe, and I can remember very, very vid vividly, and the, the folks sitting to my, my left and right probably were these folks, but my battalion commanders as a lieutenant would talk about the 70s in Europe, the drug problems, the interracial problems, the fights uh, that went on, the fact that they carried loaded 45 calibers, uh, weapons, side, side arms, uh, if they had staff duty. Because if you didn't, you were probably going to be the guy that got stuffed into a wall, wall locker and thrown out the third floor um, window of some barracks as you were, you were going through. So completely different army. But flash forward and a lot of allusion to the Big Five and doctrine changes and everything else, uh, this army that went from what I came into in the, the early 80s to, to just a couple of years later, even in the Iowa National Guard. Um, my last event in, in 1985, so four years later, we did a full up externally evaluated RTEP, 10 days, um, all the bells and whistles that you would expect out of a combat training center. Um, and as I think back, the intensity and duration of that was uh, not a lot different than uh, what we kind of get out of our, our date rotations. Um, you flash forward a couple more years later, and that broken or that army that was really, really suffering in everything that it did in 1991 during Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And people kind of scratch, hey, what was the thing that kind of turned that army around? And we'll talk about being stewards of the pre profession. And um, I mean, those all, all things are very, very important. But I personally think looking back, uh, especially considering my father and others that I grew up with was the professionalization of our non-commissioned officer corps. Um, that was probably the single biggest thing that turned the tide because officers can have great character, competence, and commitment, but if your non-commissioned officer corps is not helping you implement that, then it, that it's almost uh, kind of wasted words. Uh, but it did boil down to everybody uh, being stewards of that profession as General Kolaszewski kind of talked about. Um, you would think 70s, 80s, we grew, we're good, right? Well, Colonel Scott Green, who's sitting in front, everybody knows Scott Green, right? Because he's your boss. He was one of my battalion commanders, and oh, by the way, he's, a, he's one hell of a leader, combat proven leader. But we took over an organization in 2010, 4 4th Brigade, 4th Infantry Division at Fort Carson, Colorado. And if you think back to 2006, 7, 8, 9 time frame, when, when we were trying to build 45, 44 brigade combat teams across the Army, we were trying to grow in strength, we lowered standards, we did a lot of things across the Army to make sure that we could sustain ourselves um, through the now 18 years of war, Iraq and Afghanistan. There were some pretty significant issues on the profession side inside of our military, to the point where just in our brigade, and this was not uh, unique to that organization, but pretty pervasive throughout the Army, murders and rapes and sexual assault and all the suicides that were out of control. And so the Army had to kind of um, bring back this huge Epicon study to kind of figure out what the heck was going on with our Army. Um, we have since righted ourselves, and if you read any of the CASL or CASIP studies that have been done now and the surveys that go out every year, our profession has continued to get healthier and healthier uh, over the last decade, but my message to you, my theme to you, is that is nothing that can ever be taken for granted. Um, and uh, my colleague on my left is going to probably hit this because he was one of the architects of uh, the character development framework, uh, but character, competence, and commitment, the three things that we all hear and talk about all the time, but many, many times. I think when we start to go awry, it is when we believe that things like competence and or commitment override character. How many times in your experience have you been in an Article 15 proceeding or a chapter proceeding or something where you're dealing with an active indiscipline and the individual that's being talked about, someone will stand up, oh, this guy is the most competent NCO or officer on the planet. They are committed. They have got all these incredible attributes, but we forget the fact that they've got some serious character flaws or vice versa. So, my, like I said, my, my kind of theme and message to you is, is what we can never, ever lose sight of is those three things work 
in a very, very close symbiotic way. And when one of them gets out of balance, individually and collectively, and we don't continue to police our own over time, that is when our profession starts to falter and start to fail. Uh, but I look forward to your questions. It's an honor to be here and great to see everybody, and thanks for your service. Thank you, sir. Dr. Schneider. Well, one of the difficulties of being on a panel with four people is the time it gets to the end of the table, the good ideas have all been tossed out. <laughs> and beyond that, many of them are the same good ideas that General Funk gave to you this morning. But perhaps we can add a, a few to it, because I think my, uh, my take may be a little different than my colleagues. I'll let you listen carefully and determine where we disagree. Um, so let me start. My biggest challenge that I faced over the last 57 years as a soldier and as a scholar of the military profession is very simple. To make and to keep the Army a profession rather than allowing it to just lumber along as a big freaking government bureaucracy. That's been my life's calling. And that's now your challenge. It's your Army. You're in the middle. You run the middle of the Army. And it's, uh, I'm envious. In some respects, I wish I was back in your seats looking forward to what you're going to be able to do. But that was my challenge, to keep it a profession rather than it lumbering along as a big government bureaucracy. Why was that my challenge? Military bureaucracies lose wars. Military bureaucracies get their soldiers killed and maimed unnecessarily. In stark contrast, military professions create climates of trust, they create cohesive teams, and they win wars. I can state that emphatically because I've experienced it. I was in both of those. So let me give you a little sketch of the ebbs and flows of the professionalism of the United States Army. From its low point to a high point and now back to somewhere in between. So let me start with the low point. I might be the only person in this room, I may not be, who remembers the low point. My low point for the Army was 1971. I was on my third tour in Vietnam. I was with the 1st Cav. Um, that was a drafty Army. We had expended the non-commissioned officer corps. There was none. For non-commissioned officers from 71 to 74 to the end of the war, we used shake-and-bake E6s from Benning. They went through basic AIT, got four weeks of how to be a squad leader. They put an E6 stripe on their shoulder and sent them to us in Vietnam individually to insert into units as squad leaders. In the second of the fifth cav where I was, they got their soldiers killed and they got themselves killed by their leadership inexperience and their lack of tactical competence. Such things as in placing a Claymore mine backwards. Frankly, the Army at that point I would rate it as not better than a well-led Boy Scout troop. We lost the war. We lost the trust of the American people. And simply stated, I pray that none of you ever have to serve in an army like that. If you didn't catch General Funk's point this morning about the priceless nature of a volunteer army, I hope you're catching it now. Because for the American people ever to go back, they return to the draft and turn away from a volunteer army would be a very dark day indeed. But that was 1971. Now fast forward just 20 years, February 1991, the Battle of 73 Easting, first Gulf War. Remember that war, 100 hours, which we won decisively. Elements of two squadrons of the second ACR met decimated two brigades of the Iraqi Republican Guards Division, one of the Republican Guards Division. That was a demonstration of professional effectiveness, professional effectiveness on the highest order. I, I consider that the apogee of American, I mean of U.S. Army professionalism in the modern era. Now, how did that happen? How did we go from a large bureaucratic mess in Vietnam to the most professional, powerful land force. General Funk told you the story this morning. I won't repeat it. My colleague just articulated for it the most central element of it. Basically, there were five things 
that my generation did during that period to reprofessionalize the Army, but clearly the most critical was rebuilding the non-commissioned officer corps. Besides building the non-commissioned officer corps, we changed the training management system. We built the National Training Center, so we had standardized evaluations. Um, and then five new weapon systems were introduced. General um, Funk this morning did not mention one of the most critical of those five weapon systems. Yes, there was the Ab Abrams. Yes, there was the Bradley. Probably from my experience, the most critical was the Pershing missile. Because when we deployed the Pershing missile to Europe, I was the chief of plans in Heidelberg in 1980, when we deployed the Pershing, it had a CEP so precise that all of a sudden, Soviet forces and the myth of their land invincibility was just shattered. Third echelon forces were not going to get there. They would have lost their command and control and would have not joined into the mass campaign. So at that point, after four decades, we won the Cold War. So that generation of officers left the battlefield with a record of two and one. We lost Vietnam. We won the Cold War, and we won the first Iraq War. I only say that to help you have a framework to understand that the professional status of the United States Army is extremely perishable. And you, the majors of the Army, are those who will see that it does not perish. Or if it does perish, it will be because you, the majors of the Army, allowed it to perish. So let me give you, let me close with three facts that I would like you to etch in your mind as you move forward in this issue of keeping the Army a military profession. First point is you're not a profession because you say you are. This is probably General Dempsey's most often used quote in his tenure as the CG of TRADOC and then our chief and then the chairman. It's folly to think that we can declare ourselves a profession and intense bureaucratic tensions will go away. The second fact is the existence of those bureaucratic tensions. In truth, the Army is an institution of dual character. It is a hierarchical, structured institution, tightly controlled by the legislature, and it's been that since 1775. And that's not going to change. That is the default behavior of the United States Army is to be a big, lumbering bureaucracy. The Army was also created in its own the characteristics of profession. The historians tell us sometime between the Civil War and the First World War. So it's an institution of dual character. And there's constant, severe tensions between the behavior of those. You've seen them. Just go back and think of your last unit you served in. What were the bureaucratic behaviors and what were the professional behaviors? And what resolved the tension between them? So there is this dual character, which you always have to be mindful of. We're not able to simply declare ourselves a profession and therefore resolve this tension, which is inherent. The American people get to determine if we're a profession. This is a sociological fact. It's true for all professions. The client gets to determine when you're a profession and watch the client behave. What happened to Enron, uh, the accounting profession after the Enron scandals? What happened to the Army back in 1996 after the Aberdeen scandals? So it is the case that the client gets to determine if you're a profession. For the American people, they have historically allowed you and declared you and given you the honor of being a profession based upon two criteria. What is your effectiveness in war? And how well do you use the resources they give you, including their sons and daughters? And that's why the issue of sexual assault and sexual harassment is so critical today, because it's one of the two criteria upon which the American people are going to decide if they're going to allow you to continue as a profession. And if not, they'll legislatively give you the back of their hand. More oversight, more control, more than you need, negating the autonomy you need to do your work. My final point, the third fact, what resolves the tension between bureaucracy and profession in the Army? I want you to think of it this way, as the sun goes around the globe or the globe goes around the sun, but as the Army's post camps and stations wake up every morning 
and people are assembling, civilians, uniformed military, are assembling for operational missions, what will determine if the units that day will behave as a bureaucracy or a profession? This is the default. This is what will happen unless it is ruthlessly suppressed. This is what you must have for mission command and major combat operations. And what determines what's going to happen? Army leaders. Every day, leaders have to leverage they have to wrestle bureaucratic tendencies into professional tendencies. And that has to occur at every level. It has to occur on the Army staff. It has to occur in the operational units. It has to occur where you are now, in the schoolhouses, where we create the expert knowledge which will develop the expert practice of a military profession. So that was my challenge. It's been my challenge for the, all of the time that I've been privileged to serve. And I would submit to you it's your challenge now as you leave this place. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, gentlemen. At this point, uh, we will go to non-attribution.